Thing that has not been done, I don't think, Speaker, it's been done yet, but it's been done for us. We're leading every one of the swing states, all seven of them. So we usually get them from behind, because Republicans like to vote on a thing called Election Day. You know, in the old days, we had Election Days. Today, we have election periods. They go on forever. And last time, they went beyond and start early, start late, do whatever the hell you want. You know, we got more votes in 2020 than any sitting president in history by millions. Okay. And we did great, obviously, in 2016. We won, but we did much better in 2020. But everything, nothing compares to what's happening. I mean, you have tens of thousands of people standing outside watching us on a television, and we love you out there. We love you. They're watching. But both of those great races, both of them don't compare to what's happening now. In Florida, we took a massive lead. And all of these places, I mean, there's something happening that's really good. There's something happening that's really good. But let's close it out. Pretend you're one point down. Would everybody pretend? Let me just do a poll. Who has already voted? Who is going to vote? That's what I like. That would be better than the other way if you've already voted. So I'd say 16, 17, maybe 20 percent. And we're leading. And most of you haven't voted, but you promise you're going to vote. Everybody promise. Promise, promise, promise. It's a lot of people in here. Well, the beauty is that you know, a Republican likes to vote late, and they like to vote and make sure their vote's in the box, right? They want to vote. They just feel better about it. And uh, so we had a lot of people voting, but really, that's the same. I do it in every event. I say, who's voted? For the last three events. Last night, I was at Penn State, a great place I met. I actually met, this is an amazing, the National Championship Wrestling Team. They won the Penn State, won the national championship. But listen to this, 11 out of the last 13 years, even Jim Jordan would be impressed by that. You know, Jim Jordan is a great guy. He's a great wrestler, all-American wrestler, Jim. You can see it by the way he acts. Not afraid of anything, right? And I looked at those guys and they're rough as hell. I said, you may, the, you may be the only people that can take trendy Aragua in a fight. And it won't even be that easy for them. They're tough people. But it was great to meet that team. And uh, those great champions, amazing, really great champions. And we were packed at Penn State. We were packed. No, no matter where we go, we're packed. No matter where we go, because there's something happening. And there's something happening is they want to take back their country. People want to take back their country. You love the country. I love the country. We want to take it back. I could be right now on the most beautiful beach in the world. I could be at Turnberry in Scotland. I own it. I could be anywhere. I got that greatest. I don't have to be here, but I would much rather be at Madison Square Garden with you. But... So we're thrilled to be joined today by an incredible group of patriots who are going to help us save our country, including our next Vice President J.D. Vance. And a man who uh, was so incredible last week, I watched, I watched that rocket ship come down. I'd never seen it. I told this story last night. I was on the phone with a very, very important person. And I'm talking to him, and I'm watching the television while I'm talking to this guy. He's boring as hell. And I said, wait a minute, wait, wait, uh, wait a minute. I'm looking at the screen, and I see this rocket pouring the fire, the flames. It's all over the place. It was white a week ago, and now it's pitch black from the burning coming down at 10,000 miles an hour. It's coming down at a low. There he is. 
There is my Eli. He's that great. You know what he was doing for the last week? Campaigning in Pennsylvania. He's a sweetheart, too. So I'm talking to this guy, very important guy, big, big guy. And I have the television screen on. And there's rockets coming down. I said, you know, it was pure, beautiful white when it left, but it's burned from the fire and the flame. And it is. And now I see it coming down like this. And it's like 20 stories tall or something. It's, it's massive. And it's coming down. I say to the guy, hey, uh, do me a favor. Will you hold on a minute? Just hold on. I'm going to, I'll talk to you. This is like one of the most important people. I'm watching. I said, just hold on. I put the phone down. By the way, I never picked it up again. You know what these people are going to say? He's cognitively impaired. He's cognitively impaired. Oh, oh, you don't think so? They're the worst. They are the worst. So I put it down, and I'm watching this rocket, and I see the engines. I say, oh, it's going to crash. No, because it was looking right next to gantry. I guess they call it the gantry, whatever the hell they call it, the launching pad. And it's coming down at a bad angle, Elon. I wasn't happy. And I was a little worried. You might have been worried, too. I said, oh, no, it's not going to be good. And then all of a sudden, I saw the flame on the bottom left, and it was ripping. The flame was pouring out of that sucker, and it straightened it out like this. And it came down, and it landed. And then it's two of these big, beautiful arms grabbed it, and they held it tight. And And I said, I wasn't sure if it was a movie. I actually thought, I thought it might be one of these crazy movies. And I said, I got to call Elon. And I call him. I said, Elon, was that you? This is like about four minutes after. Was that you? Yep, that was me. I say, Elon, you're, you're a genius. You are a genius. You are a He is special. He is special. And you know what he wants more than anything else for our country to be really well run, solidly run, to be run democratically, all the things that everybody in this room wants. And I mean, honestly, he left that pad and he went to Pennsylvania to campaign. Can you believe it? And I asked him All right, we have been listening to Donald Trump uh, speak for about uh, 45 minutes or so at Madison Square Garden. Um, a lot of violent rhetoric there about migrants rambling at his rally as he normally does. Um, and again, you know, for our viewers who have been watching this, perhaps some questions as to why we would be airing Donald Trump at this moment in the race. It is not something we do very often or frequently on this network. We did want to play for our viewers uh, Trump's remarks not to platform his policies, but rather the opposite. So you, the viewers and the voters in this country can hear for yourself the vision that Donald Trump and all of his speakers today have outlined if he is given a second term as president in this country. There is a lot of dangerous language, a lot of ugly rhetoric that we are going to unpack over the course of our conversation this hour. I do want to go back to NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard, who has been inside uh, Madison Square Garden throughout this entire afternoon to give us just the context of what we have been seeing and hearing. Vaughn. Hey, Amen. I think that this evening here at Madison Square Garden has been more reflective and representative of today's Republican Party under Donald Trump than even the Republican National Convention was a couple months ago. This moment here to see the cast of allies that Donald Trump has chosen and brought on stage is reflective of those individuals who he not only believes are the celebrities of today's GOP, but also those with the greatest influence over the broader part of the electorate. It wasn't the like of Mike Pence or a Mitt Romney or Liz Cheney that's up on stage or, frankly, many members of Congress. Instead, you had the likes of Tucker Carlson. You have Elon Musk. You have Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And when we talk about Elon Musk, who we were just hearing him talk extensively about, Elon Musk is somebody when 
Donald Trump was first back in the White House. Trump repeatedly mocked in social media posts is coming to him, begging him for effectively federal contracts. And then in 2022, as Donald Trump was launching Truth Social, he called Elon Musk, well, Elon Musk was trying to purchase Twitter, he called him a BS artist. Ultimately, these two found out how to have a symbiotic relationship where effectively the country's largest online town hall, now known as X, Elon Musk has helped uh, maneuver this to be a pro-Trump, pro-GOP conspiracy theory platform that millions of Americans are getting their information from on a daily basis. And Donald Trump is not naive to that. I think the other headline coming out of Donald Trump's remarks is his talk inside of Madison Square Garden here, Eamon, about the Alien Enemies Act of 1798, which was part of the Alien and Sedition Act. To be very clear, what he is saying that he will invoke come 2025 would allow him, as President of the United States, to unilaterally call for the deportation of undocumented individuals in the country over the age of 14. If he determines individuals coming from certain countries to pose a threat to the United States. And you heard this arena of 20,000 Americans chanting, quote, send them back. This for Donald Trump has been on the front line of his rhetoric throughout his 2024 presidential bid. And it's his closing message here. This is not a message uh, that we're typically hear from presidential candidates from either party in history's past. Usually presidential campaigns and with a unifying message, trying to build a coalition. But for Donald Trump, what we have heard from not only him, but also the speakers who he chose to bring on stage here tonight, one who called Hillary Clinton the devil, another who called her demented, another who called Hillary Clinton a, 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 a godforsaken B-word. This is... Uh, for Donald Trump, a Republican Party that I think is represented in the words of Dr. Phil McGraw, who took the stage here, is uh, making the case that he is not a bully, but he is the most effective communicator for America, and Democrats and Kamala Harris are just not as good of it. I think that this is for nine and a half years we have covered Donald Trump rallies, never one here at Madison Square Garden, but I think one week out from Donald Trump potentially taking the White House again, I think this is the embodiment of where the MAGA movement has gone on and what is on the cusp of potentially trying to enact if it is placed back into power in Washington, D.C. Uh, Vaughn Hillier, thank you very much. Vaughn, um, I know you're inside. Continue to listen to that speech for us. If he says anything about the election, we'll certainly come back to you uh, to get your thoughts on it and also to hear it for ourselves. I want to bring into the conversation now Misha Cross and Rick Wilson. Also joining the conversation, Christina Greer, Associate Professor of Political Science at Fordham um, University. And again, you know, I wanted just to take a minute. Um, it, it is almost impossible to fact check Donald Trump in real time, but there were a series of lies that Donald Trump spewed throughout the course of that speech that we were listening to. Uh, lies about immigrants in this country, lies about immigrants in Springfield, Ohio, saying there are 30,000 of them. That is not true. Those that are in Springfield, Ohio, as has been repeatedly said by officials in that um, city and in that state, is that they have been there legally with the right permit to be there. He has said lie after lie about millions of criminals coming into this country. Again, people who have come into this country do not, not by the millions, have criminal records. That was a lie. Donald Trump, again, showing, um, you know, saying that he did not start any wars. This was a president who throughout his time had more drone strikes than previous presidents. He also killed Iranian generals in third countries that brought us to the brink of war. The list of lies that Donald Donald Trump spewed throughout the 45 minutes that we are listening to it is one part of why we wanted to show that to our viewers, but also more importantly, um, the rambling, the hate, the xenophobia, the homophobia that has been hallmarks of the Republican Party over the last several years were on display throughout the course of today, culminating with the president today, who spoke in this bloodlust language uh, about what he would do if he came back as president one more time. And we felt it was important for people to hear it because he has built this part of his closing uh, message. Rick, I want to give you a chance to, re to react to what we have seen uh, just from Donald Trump in the past 45 minutes of his remarks before he began to ramble and go off script.
you know, we, we yeah, we did get the orange Castro effect about forty about forty minutes in, and it's just gone crazy. Um, you know, I mean, first off, I want to say I salute the network for actually showing what he is saying and doing, and showing what the people at this event have been saying and doing. It is important for Americans not to look away from incipient fascism. It is important for Americans to know what this is. This is the spiritual successor of the 1939 German American Bund rally in the same building. This is the spiritual successor of, of the darkest kind of impulses. He is stoking it. He is feeding it. The the uh, the combination of racial and ethnic hatreds on the one hand, you know, you think that you've sort of processed it. You think you know who he is, but folks really don't. They 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 forget about it. They they put it in a file cabinet somewhere. They pretend it didn't happen. And then when you see it again, you are reminded again that the force of the entire federal government will be in this man's hands. You had Vivek Ramaswamy tonight saying we're going to deport civil servants now. This is an expansive view of a fascist America. And, and you know, again, the, 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 the lies that Trump tells are all part and parcel. You know, you know that Donald Trump is lying, including with the articles in every sentence, A and and the, you know he's lying when his pie hole is moving. But that, again, Americans need to look at it. They need to understand they will have a president who is not a truthful person, not an honest person, not a person of integrity of any kind. And so it's good to watch this as a reminder. It's good to see this sort of thing as a nightmare. I have a bunch of staff members at Lincoln Project who watch every single Trump speech, and I feel terrible for these for these folks because they really have the worst job in America. This is watching like the, the inner workings of a toxic waste dump all the time as this man continues to spew this poison out. It's also a painful thing to see, right? Because you're seeing this yes. cognitive dissonance that is taking place in this country, a disconnect between uh, what some Americans believe are true and honest and uh, righteous values that we try to hold and then see Donald Trump come and speak about them the way he did. And part of that, um, Amisha, is that he taps, as all the other speakers have been throughout the course of this day, trying to tap into a racial grievance, a gender grievance, a xenophobic grievance to try and animate this country into a dark past. In fact, one of the speakers who spoke earlier today talked about it is important to return America to a time when America was great. And he specifically narrowed that window down to the turn of the century, uh, the 19th century, when America did not have equal rights for its black citizens, for its uh, women citizens, no equal rights for a lot of the immigrants that were in this country. He specifically singled that period out because it was the time that America was the wealthiest, that there was no income tax, that there were tariffs that were being applied. And that is the time he wants to go back to in order um, to make America great, as he and Donald Trump have consistently said. We haven't even gotten to some of the other uh, members of the speakers that spoke earlier today. The, the xenophobia about Puerto Ricans, we'll discuss that as well. The comments that were made about Muslims, the anti-Semitism that was joked around uh, on that stage in front of 30,000 people, as Vaughn mentioned. But Amisha, give me your, your thoughts on what we've seen displayed, not just with Trump, but throughout the course of this day. Well, we've seen that white grievance is the engine that keeps the MAGA train going. It's the engine that fuels the Republican Party. It's the engine that Trump is hoping, hoping will take him to the White House. With that being said, you know, uh, we know what the census, uh, what the census data has told us, that this nation is becoming more brown every day and that um, whites will no longer be the majority population in this country in just a few short years. That scares the hell out of Donald Trump and white supremacists. And we know that because with every turn, he chooses to attack migrants and not all migrants, mind you. There are a lot of migrants in America from European countries who are who look as white as Donald Trump. He's not attacking them. He's talking about migrants from the Congo. He's talking about people from the Northern Triangle countries. He's talking about people from Mexico. He's talking about Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico is part of the United States. He is talking about black and brown people. And wherever he can attack them, he will do it. I think we have to recognize who he is and understand that who he is, unfortunately, is something that resonates with far too many people. I don't think that this is a shockwave moment for most of America. Just like I I don't expect a zebra to change its stripes. I don't expect a racist to wake up one morning and not be racist. What I do expect is for an America that um, is reaching towards that more fruitful democracy, an America that is supposed to be inclusive, an America that my grandparents fought for the right to vote in Mississippi alongside people like Meg Rivers, an America that makes it factual that we have representation. 
He's fighting the total opposite to take us back, to take us back to a time where women didn't have any rights, to take us black, back to a time where black people didn't have any, any rights, to take us back to a time where Latinos didn't even exist in America. He's trying his darndest to put all power, all monetary value, all consequence in the decisions of white men, specifically privileged white men. And I think that it's important that we take note of that, but also the fascism that comes out in everything this man says. Pay attention, because this sounded very much throughout the day. I don't care whether it was him talking or any one of his acolytes. This sounded like a grand wizard KKK rally. That is where we are. And if that's a place that America wants to be, that totally turns who we are on our head. At the end of the day, we are supposed to be a nation of progress. We're supposed to be a beacon of light for the rest of the world, the strongest democracy in the world. And we're watching a man rip it apart to shred. Christina, if you take a step back and you look at the different representatives that have been uh, platformed on that stage today in New York City, whether it was Tucker Carlson as a representative of the right wing and extreme media in this country, whether it was uh, leaders of the business community, as I mentioned, that individual from Cantor and Fitzgerald who wants to take America back to a time when people did not have equal rights in this country, whether it is people like Vivek Ramaswamy who said that they are going to dismantle the state of this country, deport people, proudly boasting about it, or people like Stephen Miller who simply said America is for Americans and Americans only. I think a lot of people also noted the, the, the similarity to the time of Nazi Germany when people said Germany is for Germany. The cast of people chosen today, hand-selected today by this campaign to be platformed in a city like New York is not lost on anyone who has watched this hateful day. No, not at all, Eamon. And, you know, obviously the, the location of Madison Square Garden, this is Donald Trump, quote unquote, triumphantly coming back home with all the supporters. And I'm curious, you know, the data will tell us later how many of these people were actual New Yorkers. I mean, the, the important piece to remember is we must believe Donald Trump. Ever since he came down that gold-plated escalator and he said Mexicans were rapists, when he, you know, goes through inauguration, the first order of business is a Muslim ban. So we have people like Vivek Ramaswamy who says, you know, co-signing this hateful rhetoric and this racist agenda, people like Vivek don't think that they will be affected. They absolutely will. So all of these people who think that, you know, uh, oh, Donald Trump will make, make everything better and those others will leave, what we have to understand is you don't have to be white to be a white supremacist. But in Donald Trump's second-term America, if he gets what he wants, it is, as was said before, black and brown and Latino folks will essentially be under... Uh, a scenario of an America from 100 to 150 years ago that for a lot of people seems unimaginable, but the dismantling of American democracy, that Project 2025, and the bottom of the barrel Republicans that, that Donald Trump has surrounded himself with will try and make that a possibility. So it is imperative that our viewers this evening, even if they are on the right side of history and they voted uh, for Kamala Harris, it is imperative that everyone reaches out to their networks to make sure there is not a single person in their family or community that is still on the fence. We do not have the luxury of being single issue voters. Donald Trump has made it very clear how he feels about a foreign policy. It is about the highest bidder. It is about who flatters him the most. We see this in the business community, as you just mentioned, you know, his tiff with Elon Musk, and now they've decided to become the strangest of strange bedfellows. But it is so clear as to what their agenda would look like. This is, you know, we are, every election is the most important election. We are not being hyperbolic when black women as the canaries in the mind say that this is the most important election of our lifetime because our entire democratic big D and small D freedoms are on the line. And Donald Trump, Donald Trump has been very clear about his agenda. There was a dangerous moment, Rick. I'm not sure, given all of the all of the hate that we've been seeing on display throughout the course of the day, there was a dangerous moment when Tucker Carlson uh, began to soften the ground by saying the only way Kamala Harris wins is if That's she right. cheats. And for me, my alarm bells went off. Uh, again, when you put it in the context of everything else that is being said, it may not have registered on a lot of people's uh, mind, but it does give you a sense of what the strategy of the Trump campaign, of what his acolytes, of what his megaphones like Tucker Carlson, and Elon Musk are planning on doing if Donald Trump loses right. the election on November 5th. They are already saying there is no way for her to win. They're using these kind of anecdotal evidence uh, right. of talking about being in a room of 30,000 people in New York City saying Fifth Avenue 
avenues lined with Trump supporters, that is evidence that the only way she wins is by cheating. And that is very dangerous because we know what that is code for. The 76 days between the election this year and certification will be the most dangerous 76 days in American history. This is why I am working toward, and our organization is working toward, and I hope every other American is working toward, a devastating wipeout of Trump next week. I think if we have a wipeout, that's the only thing that's going to save us from the, the violence and the corruption and the insanity um, that Donald Trump will gladly put this country through. It doesn't matter how much he loses by unless it's a real knockout, unless it's a unless it's a an Obama McCain or a or a Reagan Mondale knockout. He is going to claim he won this election. He's going to use every legal and illegal tactic he can. His people will deploy violence on his behalf around this country. We are going to have a very rough 76 days. I believe in my heart that that the people on that stage tonight are, are, you know, like Tucker, who are making that case, and, and others as well, who are saying that the only way to win is if they cheat. The only way that we're behind in the polls is if they're all crooked and rigged. That is a message. They, they're co-conspirators with Donald Trump in this effort. They're going to try to do what they did unsuccessfully, praise God, in 2021. They're going to try to do it all over again. Donald Trump must be defeated soundly this, this next week. He must be crushed because otherwise they're going to try this. Trump out there tonight referred at least four times, we're leading in all the swing states, we're leading in all the polls, we're ahead, ahead, ahead. He's saying this because his believers, his followers, need to have that message pre-wired into their brains. And my fear is that we have, we have engaged in a lot of, oh, the polls are so close, the polls are so close, and they won't believe it. And I want to say, you know, if one day American democracy unravels because Donald Trump is elected, uh, there will be no excuse for American voters to say we did not know who he was. Right. We did not know this is what he was going to do. We showed you his words tonight. We showed you some of the words of others who spoke tonight so that every American and every American who has a stake in this election knows what could happen on November 5th if Donald Trump is reelected into the White House. Uh, Rick, Amisha, and Christina, please stick around. Our coverage uh, is going to continue after a quick break. We're going to keep an eye on that uh, Trump rally at Madison Square Garden. Stay with us. So earlier today, at Donald Trump's Madison Square Garden in New York City, his allies echoed the very same Republican warning that Democrats will cheat or even steal the election. What does it mean to be American? It means we have elections we can trust and believe in. And that means single day voting on election day as a national holiday with paper ballots and government issued ID to match the voter file. That's how we save the country after we win it this time by voting early. I'll tell you something. We're making sure that we have free, fair and transparent elections and nobody's cheating in 2024. Of course, none of this dangerous rhetoric is new. This is all part of Trump's playbook from even before he lost in 2020 to Joe Biden. Uh, but this time around, his allies have developed more sophisticated ways to address this so-called threat that they believe undermine election integrity. On Friday, for example, a Virginia judge ruled that Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin's recent purge of close to 2,000 voters from state rolls within 90 days of November's election was illegal. In August, Youngkin issued an executive order that revoked thousands of Virginians um, and their voter registrations on the suspicion that they were not U.S. citizen. But when the state's Department of Elections was ordered to hand over the names of the people affected by the removals, many were in fact U.S. citizens. Now, according to voting rights nonprofit Protect Democracy, the list included both naturalized citizens and people who have been lifelong Virginia voters. Trump, of course, called the judge radical and supported Youngkin. And it's clear why he is a fan of it. Youngkin's stunt under the guise of election integrity may have cost many citizens their chance to vote in this election. We're not only seeing legal challenges against voters in Virginia, a Mississippi court led by Trump-appointed judges there just ruled that mail-in ballots that arrive after Election Day won't be counted. In South Carolina, a judge ruled that 1,918 year olds won't be added to the state's voter rolls despite a DMV glitch that deemed them below voting age. 
And Republican officials in Florida, Ohio, and Texas have all sued the Biden administration, accusing the Department of Homeland Security of denying them access to citizenship records needed to maintain their voter rolls, essentially blocking them from tracking down the mythical non-citizen voters who could undermine this election. Another danger in this year's election Voter intimidation masquerading as election security. All year, right-wing activists pushing false election fraud claims have been busy recruiting poll workers in key swing states. This group has branded themselves as the Christian version of the NRA. And in states like Georgia, police and poll workers have been training for possible election threats. But there is an irony here. There are now growing concerns that given law enforcement's history of suppressing and intimidating black voters, having them at the polls might actually make people make people feel unsafe and intimidated. And with other critics ringing the alarm, since the largest police union in this country has already endorsed Donald Trump, then there's the issue of timing. How long we as a country will sit in anxiety over who will take the White House? 2020 officials needed days to count all the votes to determine that President Joe Biden is the winner of the 2020 election. And Trump took advantage of that delay every day, spreading conspiracy theories that the election was somehow stolen after some states he was initially leading in eventually went to Biden. Let's bring in Rick Hassan to have this conversation now. He, of course, um, has been tracking this very closely. Rick, you and I have spoken many times before um, about how, and we heard a little bit today in, in, in the rally at Madison Square Garden, how the Republicans are softening the ground or beginning to sow the seeds of chaos ahead of the 2020 election, believing that the only way Kamala Harris can win is if she cheats. Many Americans, they're not following this. They may not be aware of these specific legal challenges, like as I just outlined in Virginia with uh, Glenn Youngkin's attempt to purge voters or Alabama's failed attempt uh, recently or the efforts in South Carolina and Mississippi. But how is this lack of attention dangerous, especially as we are nine days out? Well, you know, the rhetoric now is about non-citizen voting, as you've mentioned. Uh, and, and there's a reason for it. It's because uh, last time around, when Trump was making allegations of irregularities, we were in the middle of a pandemic. And so we could point to all the changes that states had implemented to make sure people could vote uh, safely in the middle of the pandemic. Um, this time around, he doesn't really have much to hang his hat on. So they're really hammering the non-citizen voting point. They've been losing most of those cases uh, because, in fact, uh, federal law is very clear that you can't have a wholesale uh, purge of voters just before an election because for the very reason you mentioned, legitimate voters get caught up in all of this. And, and when they've done investigations, they've found very low rates of non-citizen voting. But I think that's what the rhetoric is likely to be. They're telegraphing it already. If uh, it's a narrow Trump loss, I expect they will uh, rail about this. But the good news is, just saying that there's a lot of non-citizen voting is not the same as proving it. And the courts stood up last time. They didn't let Trump just put out uh, you know, fake claims of fraud and use that as a basis for overturning the election. I actually think we're in much better shape than we were in 2020, in part because we went through the 2020 experience and we kind of know what's coming down the pike. It's really assuring to hear you say that, that we are at least a little better positioned. I suspect that the other side as well is probably uh, uh, also better positioned, if you want to use that term, in terms of the resources they have. They've learned how to game a little bit of the system in terms of how to overwhelm the system. There's significant discussion around GOP-aligned poll watchers, for example, potentially threatening voters. Do you think this fear, uh, A, is valid and could actually impact voter turnout? If people feel that, you know, the poll watchers are also going to be doing more things than just simply allowing people to cast their ballots. So that's a really smart question, because there's really two things going on, right? One is, are there actually going to be either poll workers who are going to mess with things or poll watchers who are going to intimidate voters? And, you know, the track record has been actually that these poll watchers often don't end up materializing or it fizzles out because they don't really have a basis to be challenging voters in any serious way. But the other point is, even just having this conversation and talking about it might convince that marginal voter, you know, I don't want to get hassled. I don't want to go to the polling place. Maybe there's going to be law enforcement there. Maybe they're going to be people hassling me. I'm not going to bother voting. And so even if there is not a, you know, an army of poll watchers, as you know, we've been reading these stories about attempts to try and put it together, it can have a kind of deterrent effect. And just talking about this can be demobilizing. And so I think really there has to be a good balance. And the message has to be that everyone 
was eligible to vote should find a way to vote. And if you could vote early, best thing to do is either go in person or mail that ballot and get it done before Election Day so you won't be dealing with whatever potential chaos might be something that someone is planning. So, Rick, you know, as somebody who's watching this closely as an expert in the subject matter, what is keeping you up at night? What are you worried about? I mean, I've heard various experts say that the concern is not necessarily what happens uh, under the national spotlight, but actually what happens away from it. I mean, when you have uh, states that are won by, as we saw in uh, 2020, by almost uh, 12,000 votes, uh, infamously in Georgia, what happens in the rural areas where it could be a couple hundred votes that may swing uh, county and county, or when you have officials like what we saw in North Carolina just the other day saying, hey, we should elect, we should just, because of the Hurricane Helene, we should just give the state's electors to Donald Trump. We know how they would vote. What's keeping you up at night? Well, let me just say, there's some good news on that front, too, which is that Congress passed a law called the Electoral Count Reform Act that makes it much harder to try to just have state legislatures step in and, and, and come up with alternative slates of electors, which was part of the Trump plan um, back in 2020. And it was a plan that failed. Uh, what worries me is, we, you know, if you look at the polls, they're as close as they could be. We could have another 2,000-style election. It could come down to one state. It could come down to a few thousand ballots in that state. And then it could be, you know, not just the kind of protracted litigation that we saw in 2000 culminating in the Supreme Court's decision in Bush versus Gore. But in our much more polarized environment, there could be violence and intimidation of, of poll worker, of, of, of election workers, I should say, and of, of the officials who have the various roles to play in certifying the process. So I think the kind of political pressure that would come to bear if we had an election that actually went into overtime is something that really gives me some concern. And as we saw in 2020, uh, the adults in the room, so to speak, that were around Donald Trump, they are not going to be there this time around. So uh, that pressure that could come to bear could be extremely dangerous this time around. It is why, as our friend and colleague Rick Wilson pointed out, the only way to defeat this is to have an overwhelming win for Kamala Harris and to assure everyone this is not going to be a close race. Rick Hassan, professor of law and MSNBC election analyst, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate you joining us this evening. Thank you. Uh, up next, the voting block that could save democracy from Donald Trump yet again. In nine days, it could be Gen Z voters that save democracy from Donald Trump. In fact, today, the Harris team uh, took it to Twitch. Vice presidential candidate Tim Walz gaming with AOC in a clear appeal to young voters. And of course, if you were wondering, they were playing Madden. It is Sunday, after all. And it goes without saying, young voters are vital, propelled by the surprise election of Donald Trump in 2016 and fueled by his disastrous first term. Young people helped Democrats win the House in 2018. Uh, they were vital to President Biden's victory against Trump in 2020, and they certainly helped block that anticipated red wave in the 2022 midterms. The key demographic, once thought to be unreachable, is still answering the call. A new CNBC Generation lap poll shows Vice President Kamala Harris with a 20-point advantage over Donald Trump among young Americans on key issues like jobs, taxes, and trust in government. Democrats are working to capitalize on that advantage. The Harris team is pushing early voting in key swing states, targeting students and young voters through concerts, block parties, tailgates, along with a seven-figure ad buy targeting young voters on social media platforms. Joining me now is Versha Sharma, editor-in-chief at Teen Vogue, and Santiago Mayer, founder and executive director of Voters of Tomorrow. It's great to have both of you with us. Um, uh, Versha, I'll start with you. And, and whether or not young people are going to turn up. First of all, how important are they? Because I believe the, the CNBC poll that we have shows Harris winning or leading at least 20 points with young voters. Um, and it fits within the same margin that we saw in 2020 uh, between Eight, four, 18 and 39 year olds. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yes, they're going to they're gonna show up. They're going to continue this trend that we've seen, not just in presidential elections, but midterms and increasingly local and state elections as well, where they do turn out. And there are millions of new young voters who were eligible this year who were not eligible to vote in 2020. So this will be their first time voting. Uh, and I think they're incredibly engaged in this race. That's what we're seeing in our coverage at Teen Vogue. We've got seven student correspondents in seven swing states talking 
talking to their peers on college campuses and reporting from organizing and watch parties all the time. Uh, and we're really hearing a lot of engagement around pretty much everything in this race. Yeah, in Santiago, I've been hearing uh, the vice president's dump speech, and she is now woven in a very powerful line talking to young people. She turns around and asks the crowd, do we have any Gen Zers in here? She says, I know that you are uh, impatiently waiting because you are born into these crises of climate change and the economy and all these other issues that young people, uh, like most of us, care about. Is this outreach by the Harris campaign with those kinds of comments, with ads targeting swing states, college students, surrogates like AOC, Maxwell Frost, Beto O'Rourke, uh, holding rallies at events, is that effective? Is that going to do the trick in shoring up this voting bloc? Oh, absolutely. And first of all, thank you so much for having me. But I think the Harris campaign is doing exactly what it needs to be doing in this final week. They have a campus tour going around campuses in so many swing states. They're bringing surrogates, they're bringing celebrities, they're bringing Vice President Harris and Governor Walz themselves. And they have that seven figure, uh, that seven figure investment into campus media. And I think the most important thing here is that they are working very hard to earn Gen Z's vote. And that message proves it, right? And even putting aside some of the efforts from the campaign itself, when you kind of zoom out and look at the overall space, the enthusiasm, the energy is incredible. Literally, as we're speaking, Voters of Tomorrow has 175 volunteers texting into Michigan. And we have made 16 million contacts to young voters. And the one thing <coughs> that we're hearing is they are excited and ready to turn out and vote for Vice President Harris. Um, Versa, I have to ask you about the, the Gaza war and how that resonates with young people. We've obviously been seeing a lot of uh, discontent among uh, young voters in this country, um, college campuses, uh, certainly see because of social media, uh, young voters who are on social media more. They're seeing a very different reality to the war in Gaza than what uh, people are watching mainstream media are in this country, and that's also a generational divide. How is that situation going to factor with how young people vote in this country? It's, it's really worrying, honestly. I think, understandably, a lot of young people and Gen Z voters have take issue with the Biden administration's approach to supporting Israel and what's happening in the war in Gaza. I think for a lot of people or for, for a key group of people, it could be the motivating factor. And I'm not overly concerned that this group is going to vote for Trump because they think that he right. might handle the situation they might just better. They might stay on the sideline, not vote, they might stay right, home. third party. They might vote third party. They may not necessarily know Jill Stein's kind of problematic record yeah. um, of coming in at the last minute and grifting and all of that, but we're doing our best to educate voters on that respect, too. But I will say what we consistently hear um, while the war in Gaza and our response to it is incredibly important. What they're prioritizing as their top concerns are issues of personal financial security, student debt, of course. Uh, and, and the Harris campaign has been communicating a lot on those issues. What, what, uh, Santiago, I want to give you a chance as well, because I know that you're also engaging with a lot of young voters. How is this situation landing with them? What are you hearing? What are you seeing from the kind of uh, uh, points of context that you are having with these uh, voters and, and their concern about the Gaza war and how close the, the Harris uh, campaign is to the Biden-Harris administration on this issue? For sure. I think Versha is exactly right. I think this is obviously a concern. And listen, I mentioned we had had 16 million conversations. It continues to come up as, as an issue, right? But I think Versha is exactly right in the fact that it, while it is an important issue, it is not the issue that is causing them to decide what to vote on. They are prioritizing the issues that are really guiding them are the economy, are the abortion uh, ballot measures, for example, in states like Florida. And we are seeing a lot of energy to turn out for those issues and turn out for freedom. And obviously, Vice President Harris has communicated on the economy, on abortion. She continues to deliver that message to Gen Z every single time that she speaks to us. And I think that is invaluable. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, uh, Versha Sharma and Santiago Mera, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it, as always. Uh, still ahead, Christian nationalism and the role that it will play in the next nine days.
mình sẽ hướng dẫn các bạn làm phần tay phần tay chúng ta cũng sẽ có hai phần tương tự các bạn sẽ móc cho mình vòng tròn ma thuật 6 mũi đơn từ hàng thứ hai với mỗi chân móc các bạn sẽ móc cho mình hai mũi đơn trong một chân Sau đó hàng số 3 và hàng số 4 Các bạn sẽ móc cho mình 12 mũi đơn còn lại các bạn sẽ làm tương tự 